Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. On the show today, we have Roland Comtois. Roland is a clear-sighted spiritual medium, an international speaker, host of the podcast The Wisdom Keepers, and TV show Soul Stories. For over 40 years, Roland has reached many along his vocational path from physical to spiritual healing. He has worked as a geriatric nurse, Reiki master, metaphysical teacher, and grief specialist. He is the founder of the Living Beyond Loss Conference, now in its 11th year. He's the author of the books, And Then There Was Heaven, 16 Minutes, Signs of Spirit, and co-authored the book, 365 Days of Angel Prayers. Roland's latest book, Signs of Spirit, is about his development of his signature purple papers and tells stories of love lost, love found, and the connection between loved ones that extends into infinity. You can visit his website at blessingsbyroland.com. Roland's daily commitment is to help people find comfort in life in spite of overwhelming loss, to show how to move beyond grief, and to pass on the message that eternal love is genuine. Roland Comtois, a warm welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Thank you so much, Sandra. I'm thrilled to be here with you. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it very much. Oh, I'm thrilled. If you could see my smile on my face right now, you would get how much joy (laughs) I have. I've heard your name mentioned a few times as somebody had to interview. And then our mutual friend, Sherry Pearl, gave me Mm. the final push. And here we are today. So thank you for spending this time with us. My thanks again. I appreciate it. Yeah. So you're coming to us from where in this on this planet? So right now I am in Connecticut and I'm overlooking the most beautiful trees and a few horses on my right hand side back there. And I'm in this very wonderful spot uh, where I can feel all that loving energy. So I'm very happy to be where I am today. Oh, I'm glad I'm at my home in Massachusetts and to our listener, wherever you are on planet Earth or in your car or out for a walk or listening before you go to bed, just welcome to you as well. Roland, tell us about yourself. Um, there's so much that I don't well, even know where to begin. Maybe at the beginning. You maybe got? at the beginning. Yeah. You know, I was, I was a kid that always felt things and sensed things. And my mother thought I was peculiar and thought that I needed a little help and medicine and things to calm down those things that I was seeing and feeling and hearing and knowing as even as a, as a young five and six year old kid. And it was just something about the experience of feeling that energy. And then my grandmother, Isabel Jetty, passed away when I was 10. And then a, a few days later, I saw her. I saw her standing there at the end of my bed. I remember seeing her in this light, and I knew that she was peaceful because I felt peaceful. I wasn't fearful. I wasn't overwhelmed. It, it wasn't scary at all. She was there. And she was looking at me and she was talking to me and I saw light behind her. And I knew somehow at 10 years old that there was something more. And and I've been on a discovery now and and on a journey, truly, uh, Sandra, to find out what that something more is. And I've been looking for the last 47 years for that something. And that was really the beginning of seeing it in a different way and knowing that Wherever love is, there is no separation, and that separation doesn't exist. So I realize that my grandmother and all those that I've had conversations with are part of our everyday experience. That's really great. Wherever love is, there is no separation. Mm -hmm. And what a gift that at such a young age she came to. You know, I I tried to tell my people, you know, my mother, and, you know, my mother would say, (laughs) no, Roland. Meme's dead. And I'd say, mom, she's here and she's part of you and she's with you. And and my mother would say no. And I would say yes. (laughs) And I would say, you know, we'd go back and forth. My mother and I went back and forth about this our whole lives. Not that she was resisting me. It was something she didn't understand herself. She didn't have the experience herself, despite the fact that we had very, very amazing moments together after my, my grandmother passed away. But not until a few days before my mother 
passed away. And, you know, I, I get emotional talking about it now, as I do every time I talk about this moment. And I walked into her rehab room and, and there was a peace, you know, Sandra, there was a peacefulness in her that I had never seen before. And I, I went right over to the bedside and I held her hand and I, I got really close to her and I said, mom, are you all right? You know, and, and I was so almost overwhelmed that she was peaceful. I was starting to feel the same peace I felt when my grandmother was in my room all those years before. And so I looked at her and she looked at me and I said, mom, are you all right? And she looked right at me and she said, Roland, Roland, you're not a nut, she said. Oh. <laughs> And I think I thought to myself, Mom, you should be saying I love you instead. But, you know, she said, you're not a nut. And then she began to tell me this amazing story of what happened to her the night before. Hmm. My mother that never spoke this language began to tell me that the people she loved were there. And you know what she said to me that sticks with me? What? And she's been gone for some time now. She she reached out her hand and said, when my hand leaves yours, Roland, someone else will take care of me and you won't have to worry so much about me anymore. Oh. And then a few days later, she died in my arms. So the evolution of my mother and I on this journey together from not really knowing to coming into her own discovery took years and years. But man, I, I, I'm honored to be her son. I'm honored that she's my mom and, and we've had an amazing journey together. So, you know, there've been many experiences in between certainly in my life that, that helped define the journey of offering a message or a moment of hope to someone. Mm, thank you for that. I'm very close with my mom and I know we all don't have our moms on planet earth and every so often my mom loves hearing my stories. And then every so often, Sandra, when we die, we die, you know, it's like, that's yeah. it. And we're all, everybody's got people in their life that I think we'd love for them to be on the same wavelength with us, but everybody's on their own path. But the day I believe will come and how, what a gift to you that your mom got it and could tell you, you're not a nut, you know? That, <laughs> yeah. It was it was it was life changing mm -hmm. for me at that moment, you know, but I think you're right. I think there are people we're all on our, on our own unique path, making our own discoveries, learning and growing as we live our lives and, and live through the losses of our loved ones and a lot of other experiences in our lives. Um, and I think the best that we can do, you know, one of the things that I hope for when I'm with an audience or a person or something my hope, my tr my real hope is that the person I'm with for one second can catch their breath. Now, if they can catch their breath because a message came through, if they, if they get a purple paper or they feel like somebody else in the room is on their side or embracing them, I, I think at that moment we've accomplished great things, the audience and I together, or, you know, and I, I think that's, that's what it is for me. And it's what I've learned and what I've discovered, at, at least at this point. Before we go on with your story, can you talk a little bit about the Purple Papers? Sure. The Purple Papers, you know, I, I'm a guy that hears a lot of voices. And I've been hearing voices my whole life. And anyone who does any kind of energy work or this kind of work might hear voices too, right? And it became so overwhelming. And I was having trouble containing all the things that I was feeling that I would write them on paper. And then I put them on big 11 by 17 purple papers because it was easier for me to see in case my glasses weren't on. And, and, and I just started to write them. I, I, whatever I was feeling, seeing, sensing, hearing, and knowing I was writing and I would write them before I would meet an audience of people. Um, and, and then I would, carry them with me and take them where I go. So these papers have messages from people that have passed down from their first names. Some of them have their last names. Some of them just have stories. Some of them have colors and images on them, but it will only matter though to the person who receives the purple paper because it's going to be specific to them, you know? Um, so they're all pre-recorded or pre-written before I even walk out of my house so that 
you know, so there's the integrity that the message was created before someone, before you met anybody in a room. Um, and so they're all there. And, and I'm excited that, you know, Llewellyn Worldwide is publishing the first book about the Purple Papers this this summer. So there's a lot of positive energy, but the healing and the love and the, the continuity of that love that I see from those Purple Papers or my staff even sees is, is just astounding to me. So they tell a story of love that remains. It's like a love letter from, from heaven, basically. Wow. Roland, as soon as the book comes out, I, I want to have a link because we'll connect it to this episode because there will be people listening to this after it's published. So that way everybody's got that it. Would, that, thank you. That'd be lovely. Or we could talk to you again, too. That's always that fun. Be, too. I love talking to you. Thank yes. You. <laughs> are there purple papers that haven't been claimed yet? Oh, yeah, yeah. There are a probably hundreds of that are not claimed. So I have the, I still have in my possession the first purple paper that was written in 2005 for the Walcott family. Now I've met a lot of people that were the Walcotts. I even met people who, who came up to me in an, in a group and said, Oh my God, I lived on Walcott street. And I'd say, well, that isn't it. I'm sorry. It's about the Walcott mother-in-law. That's hmm. what I know. Um, and then there are, sto- there are, there are, Lots of purple papers left to be discovered um, from Mr. Gongoleski is in there. Mrs. LaFrancois is in there. Mr. Reynolds is in there. Uh, Mr. Sherman is in there. I, I'll, so they're in there. There was one once recorded that said Mr. De Simone, not a name that was familiar to me, really. And I went to an event and the woman in the room, her father was called, always called by everybody, Mr. De Simone. So she had a moment of reconnecting with her father in that moment. It was beautiful. So That's there are plenty great. of them that are left. Yes. Wow. Do you have any of them on your website? Or Oh, yeah. So they, they all get posted on social media before I, I post them before I step into a room just to keep the integrity of the messages together. Great. And so people can look at them. They can see them. And sometimes people have said to me, oh, my God, that's my mother. And then my assistant would um, arrange for us to have a free consultation. Like I just say, I sit with them and say, oh, my God, this message is your dad's. It's yours. I'm sending it to you because it belongs to you. And then they receive the message. So I don't keep the original. Um, I give them to the people they are meant for. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 that's what they do. You know, they, they, they bring a little bit of They bring that moment so someone can breathe, basically. That's really wonderful. And as there really is no time, as they say, there could be somebody listening right now that recognizes one of those names. You know how that works. I know. I love how that works, don't you? It's crazy good. (laughs) Crazy good. So you say on social media, is that Facebook? Yeah, it's on Facebook. It's on Instagram. Um, It's um, posted there. And they can just Google my name and see the papers probably. Um, and they can see them there and soon they'll be all, all 800 of whatever it is, 600 of them. I don't know the number right now. A will lot. all be on my website for people to, um, to see them and to see the evolution of them really, because in the beginning it was a few words. Now it's a full 11 by 17 page of messages that relate to something that someone went through or the story of their lives. That's amazing. It is interesting, that's for sure. I can imagine the line of people waiting in the unseen world when you pull oh. out the paper. <laughs> oh, he's no. on. Uh, no, I'm first. Right. No, I'm first. <laughs> you know what? You you're right though. You know, like when I you know, you've been in audiences with mediums before and the audience themselves are saying, Oh my god, I hope the guy picks me, right? Right. Well the afterlife is saying, Oh my god, I hope the guy picks me. I mean everybody is saying the same thing. Everybody wants the message. The, the the afterlife wants us. Our loved ones want us to know that they exist. And the people in the audience want to know that their loved ones exist. So a place where that message is realized is through the voice of someone like me. But I mean, I don't think anybody needs me, though, honestly, to get a message from their loved one. I think, I think if we could quiet down our our restlessness or ease our grief a little bit, we might be able to hear the message ourselves. And, and I think that's a very profound aspect of spiritual communication that they're talking directly to us. I believe it. And sometimes you think it's your imagination. You think it's your own voice. 
Are you? Yeah, I th- I mean, I do. I do believe it happens more often than not, but it's so easy for our ego mm-hmm. mind to blow it off. Like, no. Uh, it's oh my god! You know, I've seen I've seen people say, "Come on, mom, please, please, mom," and then mom shows up with a profound and powerful message, and then the person begins a negotiation versus an acceptance that that was something real, you know, that was something powerful. I, you know, I'm getting all emotional talking to you all of a sudden. Aww. There's a whole surge of energy moving through the space that we have created this this afternoon and that in that space is the existence of our loved ones waiting to tap us on the shoulder to touch our face gently to leave us a signal or a sign to remind us that we are loved to remind us that there's to remind us that there is the continuity of the soul really you know and so it is it is there for each and every one of us yeah, it's very special. Do you have, I, I know we're jumping all over the map because I do want to yeah, hear a little bit about, no, there's no apologies necessary. This is kind of fun, actually. Um, <laughs> although, did I just lose the question that I, oh, no, I got the question. See if I can phrase it. Is there something about being a human on earth that we're not meant to remember who we are 24-7, that we have this little voice that wants to? negotiate or say, oh, that can't really be, um, do you know what I'm getting at? I do. And I, I think, I think there is, I think you're right that on some level that there, it is part of the human experience somehow to be, to, to, to see the separation of things. But I think that as we grow and we step certainly more clearly into the knowing that we are part of the universal energy, that we are part of the spiritual energy, that we are part of the whole thing, that we we then begin to open our mind or broaden our perspective about them being part of us. And once we get to that place, that that kind of that kind of wall that's in the way starts to break down. So I think I think in time we leave behind the separation and step into the unity of the communication or the connection or our loved ones. You know, Sandra, I, in my mind, and I've never been able to, to work this out really, that when people I loved died, that they disappeared somewhere far beyond my grasp. I have always had a hard time with that Mm -hmm. in my life, you know, even before this became something for me, you know, um, I remember sitting by the bedside of my patients as they were dying and I was holding their hands. I'll never, ever, ever forget them, by the way. I will never forget them. And the reason why I will never forget them is because we were sitting together holding hands and I was sitting there not just as a nurse. I was, I was their friend. I was their grandson. I was their, I was whatever they, I was in that moment, but that moment that moment left an impression. That impression is invisible. It's love. And when that impression was made, I was able to tap back into that energy or that place or that space. As the people I I, I took care of, I'll never forget this one older lady, older, she was 90 something years old. And she was I got to say, and this may sound weird to someone listening, but she really was the love of my heart. I loved her so much. And I would walk into her room and she was always glad to see me, always happy to see me. And I I wasn't sure if everybody was always happy to see me, but she was happy to see me. And she would glow and light up and say, I'm glad you're here. And I walked into her room and she said, I'm not going to be here much longer. I really know that, she said. And I said, okay. I sat there and listened to her. And she kind of did her best to lean over to me. And she said, but I know that there's something else. And she said, I don't know exactly what it is, she said. But I know that I can still feel my mother. And she died, you know, 75 years ago. And I know that I can still feel something. And then she looked right in my heart, if you will, and said, and I know I am never, ever going to forget you. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's how it work. we le- works. We leave these impressions of love. 
Boy, I'm so long winded. I forgot your question. <laughs> no, I think you, you answered it. I'm just I'm listening. Sorry. I'm in the moment. We're on the ride together. It's great. Okay. Well, let's go back a little bit. So after you're a young person and had these visions, the vision of your grandmother, mm -hmm. growing up, did you want to get into nursing? Or you did know, you I was, that's, a, that's a really, I don't think anyone has ever asked me that question before. Um, that's a really great question. And, and because I wasn't really sure about it. I wasn't sure. A friend of mine was a nurse and she said, look, I know you have other aspirations, she said, but you'll need to do this. And I think you should do it, she said. So I decided to go to nursing school. And again, it was transformative. And she was right, because what nursing school gave me was the opportunity to really embrace the compassion and the humanity that I feel inside. And it gave me that chance to be that person, you know. And there, I'm sure there are a lot of other jobs where you embrace those those attributes. But I, I really felt that it gave me something, you know. And then I had this, um, man, it just stops me in my tracks when I think about the people that I've been with, you know, for 30 years as a nurse and the love that they've given me, actually. Mm -hmm. So I, I felt very fortunate to be able to go on that on that journey. And I always believe that every part of our journey leads us to who we are. And even mm -hmm. if we don't understand the pain that we're going through, boy, a few years down the road, looking back, you can really see the, all the difference it makes. I totally agree with you. I, I think even the detours in our, in our life paths are also opportunities to see something we weren't going to be, that we were not going to be able to see if we were on that same path. So I think it, I think the detours, the obstacles, like you just said, the pain, I think there's something in there that gets us to see another aspect of ourselves. And if we are able to see another aspect of ourselves, are we able to see the universe? Are we able to see our loved ones? You know, I think it's all a process of growing into who we really are. And we never stop growing. <laughs> right. I don't think so. No, I I. I really enjoy talking with you. This is great. So <laughs> on your journey now, did you actually become a medium like you're doing readings on people or how no. did it develop that you started to share what you were hearing and feeling? And so, you know, I, at, at 16, 15, 16 and 17 years old, I would call my friends at seven o'clock and say, I have a message for you. I'd go to their house and give them whatever message I was feeling. And from that began the development of opening myself up to what it was that I was feeling, seeing, hearing, sensing, whatever, right? I just kind of continued learning and growing. Now, you know, some people will ask, uh, and many people have asked me, well, where did you train? I didn't take a class. I've never taken one class. And, and I don't know if that's good or bad to say, but I never have. I I started a long time ago feeling that energy within me, trusting that energy energy within me and allowing that energy to guide me. And so I started doing readings for people. I, I mean, my first place where I ever sat and did readings publicly was in a bar. You know, I was <laughs> a teenager. I was at a bar. And guess what? I don't think I've ever told the story before, but I was at a bar and I was right off the side of the dance floor. So there I am trying to connect to energies, feelings, messages, people, loved ones, whatever, on the dance floor of a bar in Rhode Island many, many years ago. And it has developed from those places. If you can do it at a bar, you can do it anywhere with all those distractions, <laughs> the music, the people dancing. Well, you know, in and, 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 and truth, that's what it feels sounds like inside. So, you know, when you're with an with people, when the messages are coming, there's a lot of activity going on, just like it is in the bar, the music, the dancing, the loud noises, all that energy is there. That same energy exists when the the universe or our loved ones are trying to communicate their message. Because like you said a, a few minutes ago, they're all out there saying, come on, talk to me. I got to get a message to my son or to my mom or someone, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm just imagining a busy city with all kinds of people. And then, you know, in the background, the spirit world, then in front of you is a big audience. And, oh, wow. How do That's you? That's exactly it. 
You you hit the nail on the head. It's like an air traffic controller. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, I might have to use that at one of my Take gigs. It. Can I use it? Yeah. Um, I, I love that analogy. I never thought of it that way. But yeah, lots coming and going. But then you have to, for safety's sake, zero in on one person. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great analogy. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. Sure. Hey, well, I'll share the wealth. Um, <laughs> no, but that's just the image that came to mind. But is, I mean, not experiencing this myself, is there a way you just kind of hone in on the one person? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, that that's years of practice, I think. Um, at, at my events, when I say, when I see something or feel something, I go to the person and I say, your mom wants me to talk to you. Oh, I don't say, I don't say um, anything other than what I feel or sense or see or know in that moment. Right. So if I, if I don't know someone's first name, I'll tell them the story I hear and the story I hear generally is what they need to hear somehow, you know? So for me, it's just, saying what's there, speaking from that place of love, rem- rem- being uh, uh, aware of the, uh, of their, of the person who's before me, the energy that they're feeling and really supporting them through the process, because it's all about catching your breath, feeling a little bit of healing, feeling supported, and then getting the message. The message isn't even the first aspect of this. The first aspect of this is being supported. Can I just tell you a little story? Heck yeah. <laughs> so there was, a, okay. There was a, a I, I'm, you know, there, I see a lot of people every year and it's hard to remember everybody, obviously, uh-huh. but I will never forget this one woman I met. She was in her twenties when I met her and she was sitting in a room with 50 or 60 other people. Uh, my audiences are a little bit smaller purposefully so I could talk to as many people as possible. And she was there and, and I was starting to talk about her father and I was saying whatever it is that I was saying. I don't remember the details of what I'd said to her, but what I do remember is when I started to talk to her, I heard a sound come out of a human being that I've never heard before. I heard a, oh, it's so, it makes my hair stand now. What came out of her was of grief and a pain that was so deeply entrenched in her that the second I said whatever it is that I said, she made a sound and sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. I stopped the audience from doing anything. And I said to the audience at that moment, this is your chance to step up and to be part of this girl's life. And some woman all the way at the other end of the room came over and held this girl as she cried. My hand was on her shoulder. A stranger was holding her and she sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. And the reason why she cried was, and she told me this after the event, that whatever the message was for her, she was on her way to meet her father for the first time in a very long time. And on the way, driving there from Connecticut to across the country to somewhere, um, at just to California, I mean, across the country, she, her father died while she was driving there. And she arrived in California with her baby that he was going to meet for the first time and he was gone. Oh. And the words that came to her helped her. But what helped her first was a strange stranger coming up to her and holding her and embracing her and loving her. And the entire audience turned to her and sent her a part of themselves. That's what happened that day. So, you know, the message comes, yes, but what comes before that is the loving support. And then what comes around that is the healing possibilities for someone um, to to go through the journey of hearing and feeling and experiencing the message that might give them what they need to take the next step in their lives. I forgot why I was telling you that story. No, there's no need to remember. It's just great. Uh, I don't either. We're we're in the moment. And see, that's what's important. And there's something that you're saying that just makes me realize like we can turn love on in any second and it doesn't even matter if we know the person yeah. to love them. And then what shows up is, 
you know, looking at a total stranger and somebody walking across the room to be there for someone. Yeah. I, you know, I think, I think love is so beautifully innate within each cell of our being that when we have a chance to truly step into it, it happens almost, it happens without thinking because I think it's a, I think it's part of all of us, you know, and I've seen it so many times where someone steps beyond their own grief and embraces someone like there's no tomorrow. And it is profound. It's profound to me. The messages are great. The messages are, uh, you know, they are, they are for me, and I'm not speaking for the audience now, I'm speaking for myself. Sometimes I take my breath away. How, how did that happen? How did those words come to be? How did that just happen when that paper was written and given to somebody? It's so mysterious and not all at the same time. If we truly look at love for what it is, this innate energy within each soul, then we unlock the doorway to love by just being in a space and being in that place. So I, I learned early on, very early on, by the way, I, I learned when my father abandoned us, my sister and my mother, I knew then that I had to understand love because otherwise my only mission would have been hate because I was so angry at right. him. So I had to make a decision to really understand what love was and what love is to really to connect to everything. So, And life can be tough. I did a course once and, you know, you realize that you would have to actually walk in somebody's shoes their entire life and feel what they feel to understand the decisions that people make and say, you know, why your dad left for whatever reason that is. Yeah, you know, it, it, I think it's easy it's easier to maybe judge that experience, but I, instead I made a decision and it took a long time. Let's say, I mean, I was 10 years old when he left. So it took a little time to really embrace that love. And then, then I was feeling all this energy. And then I know I was knowing that there was love and, and you know, and all these things were happening in a, in a 10 to 17 year old person that was, and then trying to be 10 to 17 years old. So there was a lot of things happening but I, I made a decision to figure out my way through it um, and to embrace each of those obstacles and detours. Hmm. That, my, my mind is just thinking, put love in. <laughs> yeah. You know how people wear those glasses that are either pink or blue <laughs> or yellow? Like what if the lens was love? That's, that's great. What if it was? Or, or what if you just needed a reminder to reconnect to that energy. What if you yeah. just needed a little reminder? You know, every so often I give out love, uh, uh, rose quartz hearts to remind people um, of love. Um, every so often I, you know, I, I, uh, when I'm doing my events, I stop the audience and say, let's all text someone we love right now. And, you know, and we all laugh about it. I, I did a church thing, a church sermon a couple of weeks ago, and I made the audience stop. I made them take their phones out. I made them. I didn't make them do anything. I suggested. Yes, heavily <laughs> suggested. suggested mm -hmm. You know, that this would be a good idea. And all of a sudden, everybody was doing it. And you could feel the room get lighter just because of that experience. Roland, this, everything you say and do and your past, like I keep getting the word trust. Mm. And I, th I think you've trusted what's come about on your journey and you trust when you're writing the purple papers and you trust when you're with an audience and you just trust. And, and I, and, you know, for myself and others, you know, there's the gap there because I don't always live life trusting what I feel, what I think, uh, what I hear. And it's just, I just see for myself, there's a whole nother level because you're filled with love I feel like you're an open book. You just, you're in uh, just such a good way. You're, you're just being very real and I, trusting. Yeah. I think, I think it's important for us to be real with each other. Yeah, really, truly. Um, and the trust thing, you know, I've been working on that. Well, this, well done. I, I and this, to is, think and this, is, this is where I am right now. <laughs> you know, I've been working on that. And, and when I hear the voice though, when I feel the energy, 
I do trust that moment because, you know, I made an agreement a long time ago. You know, I said to the spirit world, I said, look, if you want me to do this, I'm honored to do it. Um, but you got to help me along the way. You've got to give me little moments to to uh, to strengthen my myself so that I can totally entrust myself into this moment. And it's become that now. So when I hear a story about Robert or Mr. Gongoleski or um, so specific, if, these names. I mean, if, if I read the purple papers to you, they are specific. There's not. There's not. There's not. There's no getting around them. They're so specific about the life of the person. Um, and, and you know what else is interesting with those messages? They don't, they don't vary, meaning even though it's specific and two people could look at it and feel something from it, mm -hmm. when I'm with the person it belongs to, it all sinks into place. And then I trust again, just like you've mentioned. I mean, I trust in that moment that it's working out exactly as it's supposed to. And that message will do what it's supposed to do. So, you know, it, it is about building the trust. It really is. It is about building that trust. And that's what I've come to uh, understand. Like I'm holding in front of me a purple paper that says, Lou does not want, Lou does not want to admit, but I was old. And he goes on to express the depth of that feeling for him. Uh, for, for for Lou and then it goes on it goes on to say other things about now I'm finally happy and 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 he goes on to express his whole experience right it's it's there's nothing about them that really leaves you waiting there's one here from Joey Joey left unexpectedly I had no idea it was going to happen so fast I honestly have to say I did my best and he goes on to say more and he talks about the stars at night because it's on the paper and certain things are highlighted. So it takes a lot of trust, as you said, mm -hmm. to hear that and then to stand in front of someone and say, here's your paper. Here's your message. And and that Joey one was delivered the other night in Johnston, Rhode Island, um, to a woman whose brother passed very unexpectedly. And when she read the paper, she started to cry because she knew in that moment that her brother was reaching through the veil, if you think there's a veil or a doorway or something, mm -hmm. trying to communicate his message. So, you, you know, Sandra, you're right. It, it takes trust. And 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 just because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm telling my story this way, I have moments where trust, I need to build it up a little bit. But it's certainly not, though, when I'm communicating with the spirit realm or, or our loved ones or feeling that energy, because I really believe it, because I feel it first, then the message finds its way forward. When the message comes through, do you hear voices? Is it your own voice or is it just like a knowing and your hand starts to like move, you know? Yeah, so it's a it's a. It's many different things. Sometimes it's just kind of an automatic writing kind of thing. Sometimes it's the voice of a man. He's talking like this, and I feel that. And then I try to, I try to showcase that on the paper, meaning by if it's someone like that, I, I say that on the paper. Or uh, I, if it's somebody humorous, I try to say he's joking now. I try to bring the presence of that person to those purple papers. Um, and sometimes it's just my own voice, but no, no matter what it is, the, the voice in my head, the voice of another, the picture that's being painted comes with something else, a deep and profound knowing mm -hmm. that it's something coming from that place. It's really that's special. And I still see that line of people. <laughs> waiting for you to pick up the pen next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a line. I mean, I, I don't write. I don't write any longer seven days a week though, because no. it's too consuming. So I do write five days a week. That's um, still a big commitment. And there is a part of. I mean, you're a human being, and um, you know, to have a life and be human and share and everything like that. So you've got to have balance. Well. This is a lesson I'm learning, and, and, and those people out there that are sensitive to energy and, and you feel things yourself, you, you, we have to find balance. We have to find balance, body, mind, and spirit, and we have to find balance 
in every aspect of our lives. It's the only way that this will, uh, that we will be able to move through the, through the experience. And I work at finding balance every day. I listen to my body every day. I listen to my body now more than I ever have, more than I ever have in my whole life. And, you know, for the last two years, I was forced to listen to my body because of some physical changes I went through and some scares I had. I was forced to go down that road. So I listen to my body. I listen to my spirit. I listen to my emotions. I trust what I'm feeling when it comes to the spiritual realm. And I, and I just embark on my journey. I mean, it, it is my mission to bring one little moment of hope. That's what I'm on a mission to do anyways. Well, you're, you're doing it. So, and, and then just even talking about listening, you know, I'm thinking, I don't listen to much. It, it, it's very easy to listen to the voice in our own head that's critiquing life as we see it, thinking about the past, worrying about the future, but listening to your body, listening to your emotions, listening to your feelings, that all gets you in the present moment. And I can't help but think that there's power in that and your intuition can come through and that love and that. It's true. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I teach my students is, is the one thing I want you to uh, learn from this experience is to befriend silence first. So anyone who comes to me for any kind of training or teaching or whatever, the goal is to get silent. And in that silence emerges light, the message, the knowing, trust, that silence is the catalyst to all things. So I, I work really hard at silencing my ADD, ADHD <laughs> mind because I have that mind. And I know a lot of people are crazed with all kinds of life experiences now and things are overwhelming. And, and actually, you know, I feel so peaceful sitting here with you, talking with you today. I'm looking outside, as I said already, the green is grass. The horses are having a blast out there down in the neighbor's yard. Nice. And this is just this overwhelming sense of peace. But the second we walk out there into the world, the world is spinning and moving and, and, and doing all kinds of things. So we have to really come to understand what that silence is and, and really be in silence. And that's one of my big, you know, my big stories to tell people is if we can get silent, then we can truly hear what the universe, what the spirit world, what our loved ones, what whatever exists there wants to communicate to us. Not only that, we have a, a greater sense of ourselves because of it. We have a greater sense of who we are when we step into that very quiet space because that's where truth is where light is where love is i like it i like it a lot <laughs> and it, we all want to have great things happen and intuition and communication with our loved ones and things and it's like give it to me now i want it now you know yeah. and but then it's like well have we done the first step befriending silence mm. right you're right Hmm, have we? Talking yeah. to, and I just have a mirror at myself here. I'm not directing this at anybody else. <laughs> but we say we want things, but, you know, we've got to put in a little bit of the work or take away the distractions. Or whatever. Yeah, and, and we have to do the work. Fortunately, unfortunately, however you want to look at it, we have to do the work because there is a greater sense of um, accomplishment by being in that space. And I, I, I'm going to say this because I feel it 100% that if you really understand the silence, then the whole universe is communicating with you. It gives you the opportunity to see your loved ones. It gives you an opportunity to see whatever it is that, that you believe exists be just beyond our breath. It is there already. You know, it's there. All we have to do is sit quietly. I tell people to do the 60 second spiritual workout. What's that? Sit for 60 seconds. Oh, how about that? That's it. And it, it's not that <laughs> it's not that thrilling, but you know, 60 seconds leads to five minutes. Five minutes leads to 10 minutes, you know? And at some point you feel refreshed, renewed, and ready to really take the next step on, on your journey. And again, as I said at the beginning of our time together, I think everybody is a medium. 
I think everybody is connected. I think there is not one book in the universe that says Roland Comtois is the one. It doesn't <laughs> say that. It says it nowhere. I've never found it in any book. It says in all the books I've read that all have the connection, that all have the opportunity, that all have the inspiration, that all of us have it. And, and, and our job is to continually unlock that and, and let that door widen and widen so that we can see, that we can see the, the universe. I mean, so that we can see it all. Wow. You know, uh, I don't know. Can I keep talking or yeah, should I? Yeah, keep talking. I, I'm long. I, I already explained I'm long-winded. Well, you know? I'm loving it. It's great. I okay. think we all are. Okay, good. Well, good. I don't feel so alone then. Thank no, you. No, don't um, ever I, feel alone. I, uh, I, I had, you know, a near-death experience 30 years ago. It taught me, as did my grandmother standing before me, as did my time sitting with my my patients that were dying, as did sitting with my mother when she was dying. All of this has taught me that we truly exist. And as your radio show says so clearly, we don't die. We just don't die. We are light. And, and when I think about my mother, maybe we should all think about our people right now, everybody that's listening. Because when I think about my mother, and maybe when you think about your family, Sandra, mm -hmm. that have passed, what is it about them that you loved so much? When I think about my mother, it's that something inside of her that made her so extraordinary. The part that really is invisible. You know, the Bhagavad Gita for Westerners says that when the matter part uh, falls, the spirit remains standing. So it is the spirit that remain standing and that we all have access. So when I think about my mother, I think about how I smiled near her. I think about how I loved her. I think about the times that we had together and I laughed. I also think about the times mm -hmm. that were hard, mm -hmm. but it's the part of her inside that, that we're connecting to. Love is by far the most extraordinary communicator that exists in the universe now. And if the message is coming from love, even though there may have been hardships in the relationship, there is a moment re to reclaim that love now. So I think about my mother's love. Think about your people and their love and their energy and what you experience with them. And that might be the catalyst to get the message besides befriending the silence. That's pretty great because when I think of my dad, my grandmother, it's I, I mean, I can feel that essence. I can't put it into words exactly, but there's definitely the humor and the love and just all of that. That's I, I don't, I don't think there's a word that describes that yet. Mm -mm. I don't think there's. You're right. I don't think there's one word that can describe th the soul aspect of who we are in a language that we understand yet. I think we're growing into that language. I think we're growing into it. And I mean, maybe we say love, yes, but, you know, love gets a little washed down unless you really put action into love, you know. Um, and so that love, that energy, that something really is the connection that exists between us. And that connection allows us to have a, a much deeper, more profound, really, relationship with those that are here and those that have passed on. Mm, I love it. And that, it does help with the, the living as well, you know, because they're, let's face it, we're around many, many people and um, we can love them as well. I I want to ask you about your books and your conference. Time okay. goes by really fast, as you know. It notice. certainly does, I know. And oh not that we have to cut this short because we don't. I want you to, you know, we don't have a, a real time limit. I like to try to keep it around the hour kind of thing. Okay. But, okay. We, you know, we go a little bit beyond. But if you wouldn't mind talking about your books and sure. your conference and thank what you. you're up to, what's your passion, All just right. keep thank talking. You. Just keep thank talking. You. Well, thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Again, thank you. Um, my first book is And Then There Was Heaven, A Journey of Hope and Love. It's a spiritual memoir about the experiences of my life with nuggets of hope and inspiration tucked within the book. 
Um, in the middle of the book, there are blank pages. And in the blank pages, they're purposely placed so that when you come to that particular part of the book, you stop, you breathe, you reflect, you remember your life, who you are, what you are, why you are, you know, and you just kind of stay in that space for a while. And then you can follow through to the rest of the book. The second book is called 16 Minutes When One Breath Ends, Another Begins. It really is the journey of a medium's experiences of his mother's passing. And it's told from my perspective of my mother's life and the journey that we had together um, and, and what we went through. And in the back of the book is um, a grief guide. So there are some helpful hints because all we can do is offer helpful hints with grief and loss. I mean, mm -hmm. everybody experiences it their own way. Um, so there's just a little bit of a guidebook in the back of the book that will help people to navigate possibly what they're going through. And then Signs of Spirit, as I said, it, it's not released yet. It will, will be released on August 8th by Llewellyn Worldwide. It's a big deal for me. It's my first published book the other others were self-published um and it's it's 45 stories of the purple papers so you don't hear my voice in this in this book at all you hear the voice of the people whose stories whose lives have been touched by the purple papers um and then i'm a co-author of many authors though in the 365 days of angel prayer book so there's a lot of people involved in that book um, I also have the Living Beyond Lost Conference, which has been on hiatus for the last year and a half. Um, but it, it, it's a place where people can come and get healing support, loving support, uh, and messages about loss. Um, and we've done it in Connecticut and in uh, Rhode Island in, in the last 11 years. Um, and then I have a stage play called Through the Door. It's my scripted version of my near-death experience with original music and songs that I've written and songs that I sing. Um, and so all those things are things, you know, that I do. Plus, You're a multi-talented man. <laughs> I guess so. Well, I like singing, though. I do like singing, and, and I like singing those songs because they're, you know, they speak to me since I've written them and I had an experience. I had a near death experience. So they it, I really get to tell the story from my perspective. So in its stage, it's a stage reading and then there's a th theatrical version of that. So, you know, so that that is I find a lot of joy in that. But I, I will tell you, though, that what brings me the most joy in my world is being with someone who can catch their breath. I mean, it, I, it, doesn't, it may sound like a cliche, but the truth is when someone is shedding their grief or releasing their fears or their tears, and, and I, I get to stand by their side and hold them up or be with them, or hold their hand or give them a message, then I, then I feel very fortunate in my life. And I felt the same way as a, as a certified nursing assistant to uh, the job that I, the mission that I do now. So from my job as a nurse all the way to this, I, I am honored to step in that space because that's where I think the truth is. That's where I think love is. And that's where I think the healing is. That's very well said. And I think one of the common denominators that brings myself, you and, probably 99.9% .9 of people listening right now is that we've all experienced grief and to, it's not cliche to catch your breath and really give people hope and give people a knowing. And just a few days ago was the uh, ninth anniversary of my dad's passing. Mm. And it was really interesting because it's more than catching my breath. I was of this Oh, it's May 11th. Dad's fine. You know, I, it's like, yeah. that was not the Sandra previously, but to like, I live a whole new life with everything that I've experienced with all these great conversations that we share like this, mm -hmm. the people that I've met, the community, and that's, I'm sure the same thing holds true at one of your events or whenever you speak, this is community, these friendships that are built. And 
it's more than catching our breath. It's giving us life. It's giving us our life back. Yes. You know, that's true because in all the years I've given messages, I've never heard the afterlife or the universe say, or a loved one say, don't go to work. Don't (laughs) be depressed. I've never heard it. I've never heard anybody say that to me. I've never heard the afterlife. I've never received a message that said, you know what? Since I left, why don't you sit on the couch? (laughs) No one has ever said it. Imagine. They said, come on, I'm right here. I'm right by your side. Look for the signs. Feel the love. Get the message. You know, they've never said all those other things, but we're human beings and we are attached and connected to each other. It's part of the human experience. Mm -hmm. Now, I know there are some philosophies that say we shouldn't be attached, but the fact is we are connected. You know, we are connected to each other. And when that moment comes, when someone passes, no matter how young or or how old, there's still an emptiness that you have to navigate through. And sometimes, you know, uh, someone like me or us helps us to navigate through for a moment or two. And catch our breath. And catch our breath, basically, yes. Oh, Roland, thank you, thank you, thank you for this fastest hour that's ever gone by in my life. (laughs) This conversation. I can't believe it. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate being here with you today and meeting you. So thank you so much. Oh, we'll see each other in person because we both live in the same New England area. Is (laughs) is there anything I forgot to ask you or that you said, oh, I'd never mentioned this Um, or any last bits of inspiration? No, I I think I think if we remember, though, that that the connections that we make with our loved ones they validate the continuity of life and they and they remind us of the existence of the soul they remind us that we are not alone and that is what really feels good is that we're not alone that we are still loved and that we are still supported through this experience that's that's all i have (laughs) that's all you have it's it's just the beginning of a beautiful relationship with all of us And thank you, Roland, again, for your time and your dedication and being an inspiration, just who you're being on this interview. You're just being love and you're being trusting and you're just being yourself. And you're a a gorgeous human being. You really are. Thank you. You're welcome. And for our listener, you too, gorgeous human being. Thank you for being here for the past hour, listening to Roland and I. and. I uh, can't thank you enough for giving your time to this, whether it's your first episode or your 300th and some. I believe this is episode 311, quite a few. But wow. but thank you, because it's an investment in yourself. It's a reminder of who you really are. And there is a bigger picture. There is an unseen world with tons of love around you. I absolutely love the 60-second spiritual workout And I think that's something we can all start doing immediately. But there is an access way to open us up to the unseen world. And it takes a little work on our part, but you're not alone. And we are here for you. So as a reminder, all episodes are at wedontdieradio.com, as well as on iTunes. Well, iTunes just has the last hundred. uh, But YouTube, they're all there as well. In the description of this episode, I have the link to Roland's um, website, which is Blessings by Roland or RolandComtois.net. And as soon as his latest book comes out, we will have a link to that. And everything else he's up to, you can find in the description below. I invite you to join our We Don't Die listeners Facebook group. It's a fun place to be inspired and hang out with people that you can have these real conversations with. It's really great. And what else do I want to say? Just another thank you to our fabulous guest. I'm leaving filled with love and really challenging myself to trust more and to do some spiritual workouts and listening. So in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain. Always so happy to be your host on We Don't Die Radio. I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is important. And remember, wherever love is, there is no separation. So turn on the love.
turn it on and just watch your world unfold. Thank you for listening and we'll see you soon.